Halo. Can we see the Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Michał Karnowski. It's a great honor to, to be here to take part in this very interesting conference. And I do appreciate um, member of European Parliament, uh, uh, Patrick Yaki. Uh, uh, he, he organized this. I think it's, it's very needed, very interesting. Uh, we are discussing here the cultural clashes in Europe, in European Union. We experience it uh, every day. Uh, we see, we feel that uh, our uh, values are uh, attacked, are being constantly attacked. Uh, uh, our school, uh, our children, uh, so many problems. Uh, we uh, ask the question, yeah? we give the question, should we fight, should we adopt? So uh, I hope that uh, our uh, evening's guests uh, will help us to, uh, to give the answer, especially because we are, uh, we are going to focus on cultural clashes in America. I think there is a connection between these two continents, between these two words. Now we are one word, uh, you know, uh, media are everywhere, so uh, we are connected, we are uh, discussing the, the same things. We are experienced uh, the same things, experiencing. So, uh, oh, I see we have our guests. Uh, oh, can we see? Please, okay, uh, welcome, welcome, uh, uh, professors, I can say. Okay, let me introduce my our guests. Uh, Professor Thomas, excuse me if I make some mistake, Fili de la Nouvelle. I hope it's, it's, it's proper, yeah. The chairholder of the chair of geopolitics at uh, RAN School of Business. Welcome, sir. Okay. We have uh, Professor John Radzilowski, professor of history, University of Alaska Southwest. Yeah. Can you hear me, Professor? Okay. Yeah, okay. And Professor uh, Christopher C. Hart, the Institute of uh, World Politics in Washington. Uh, it's it's great honor. Thank you. I do appreciate your time. Thank you for for being with us. We have beautiful evening in Warsaw, <laughs> the the real autumn we may say Polish beautiful autumn, but uh, the discussion is is about something uh, uh, which is which is really concerning, really difficult. So uh, as far as I know, I was informed that uh, you were asked uh, to to prepare the open statement, just uh, how how. What is your perspective? Or what what is your 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 vision of of this issue of of the uh, cultural clashes in America? So may, maybe start from the the U.S. the Washington. So uh, uh, Professor uh, Hall, please uh, the the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Um, it is uh, so. I'm getting very strong mixed minus here. Uh, hold on one second. Let me turn my camera yeah, off. Okay. Uh, we can hear let me hear if that is well, working. So. That uh, allows me to actually speak. Um, I hope that's working for everybody. But so uh, I'm I'm honored to be here, especially given that uh, two things. First of all, New Direction Foundation. I know founded by Maggie Thatcher, uh, the Iron Lady, and. Um, she is a great figure in history and helped to save the world, frankly, uh, along, with, um, uh, along with Pope John Paul II and, and uh, our President Ronald Reagan. Uh, and also, um, I'm a big fan of Warsaw. I've, I've, uh, spent, uh, I've spent several weeks in Warsaw over the, wow. the last uh, several years, and I love Warsaw, and the uh, Polish people are, are terrific. And uh, I'm married to a Croatian, so... Uh, it, it's not the same thing, but I know for American, of course, Eastern Europe is all one big country, so I, I figure that that's uh, approximately correct. So um, thank you for the opportunity to be here, and what I would like to, to talk about is the, uh, the clash of cultures in the United States, what it is, 
Uh, and I'd like to give you some specific information uh, from my research, which is uh, not, I think, widely publicly known about um, how it will affect the world and specifically about the way in which the radical left in the United States is using the culture clash to weaponize uh, America's national security apparatus. And I'll be, you know, I'll be specific about this, right? I'm not just claiming it uh, uh, sort of theoretically, but I'll give you some, uh, some specifics from my research. Uh, also, you know, I think that the context of this, it has to be seen in the context in America, uh, and probably in Europe, although I'll let others speak to that, it has to be seen in the context of the march through the institution, right? The idea, the Gramscian idea that, uh, you know, of course, Antonio Gramsci was the uh, early 20th century Italian uh, uh, Marxist who talked about ways in which one could capture a Western society and transform that society into a socialist state. And he posited that the, what he called the instruments of consciousness needed to be captured um, by the forces trying to change society, that is by the socialist movement in the country. And those instruments he named three, as I recall, he named uh, the unions, uh, churches, uh, and uh, I don't remember what, oh, uh, of course, the education educational institutions, the school. And later in the, uh, in the 20th century, French uh, neo-Marxist Louis Altheiser talked more specifically, and he laid out a set of what he called uh, the ideological state apparatus. He said it isn't just consciousness. It isn't just false consciousness that's created by these organizations. Actually, there are uh, tools that the state uses to impose an ideology on its people. And therefore, he laid out those three plus the media and sport and all cultural institutions. And, and then he distinguished those philosophically from the ideological repressive apparatus, the state repressive apparatus, I should say. So the, the police and the security services and the military. So. Why am I talking about this, this philosophy? It's because you can't understand, in my judgment, the culture clash inside the United States without understanding that the uh, America's radical left, um, and by that, you know, I speak very specifically about this newly, this evolved ethnosexual green socialist movement, which is kind of the hybrid weaponized, evolved version of the Marxist movement that, that's been created over the last uh, century, that radical left, which is illiberal, right, it is, it is, uh, it is opposed to not only Judeo-Christian mores uh, and Western civilization, but it is opposed to liberalism, the, the, the core tenets of liberalism, including free markets and capitalism um, and uh, the democratic process eventually, right, as soon as they are, uh, as soon as they are in control. So uh, I, my own view is that the clash of cultures in the U.S. is the culmination of the, the American left getting control, finishing its control of the um, ideological state apparatus in the country. So basically all of the of what Louis Alt Altizer described is now in control of, of the radical left. So let me tell you three specific stories um, about the way that this has translated, the culture clash has translated into an effect on the American security uh, establishment, uh, and then I'll hand it off to others. And um, I think that this is really about what the effect of this culture clash is going to be on the rest of the world, especially the US, uh, especially Europe, because my own view is that the national security apparatus of the United States is in the operating control of 
uh, forces which are no longer tightly bound to the elections which take place in the country. And I'm gonna, I'll make a case. And you can reject it if you like, but this is what I believe is, is happening based on the research that I've done. So um, on, on October 30th of 2008, um, in Columbia, Missouri, a small town in a, in a flyover state, as it were, uh, Barack Obama proclaimed that they, that quote, we are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States. Now, what did he mean? Well, with respect, there's all sorts of things that we could talk about, and this is the culture clash, right? The desire to fundamentally transform the country as opposed to not fundamentally transform uh, one of the greatest countries and certainly the greatest civilization that has ever graced the, the face of the world. Uh, but specifically with respect to the security state, uh, Janet Napoli, you know, they, they were elected, of course, Barack Obama and Joe Biden were elected then five days later. And um, in March of the following year, as the administration was coming into power, the um, secretary, I think then designate of uh, the Department of Homeland Security for the United States, Janet Napolitano, said in a hearing, uh, she used, instead of the word terrorism, she used the word man-caused disaster. She did not use the word terrorism in her remarks. And she was asked why. And she said, we want to move away from the politics of fear toward a policy of being prepared for all risks that can occur. Um, so, of course, the politics of fear are the politics of realism, the politics of understanding that we had had in the United States. Planes flown into our, building, uh, into our buildings, and we'd spent a trillion dollars to that point. Right to try to stop it from happening again, and of course this uh, uh, this began uh, eight years of dramatically increased terrorism across the globe, peaking at about thirty-five thousand deaths, I believe, worldwide, including many in the European Union because of, I believe, Barack Obama's policies. So um, he claimed falsely, and I quote: "There's no religious rationale that would justify in any way what any of the things that they do." That is the uh, Islamic terrorists. Um, that's a lie. Um, you know, the English word is lie for that. Uh, that's not true. In fact, Islam does, uh, in my judgment at least, um, have a very major role for violence. It's, it's, uh, and terrorism, I think, it's squarely within what we call terrorism now, fits squarely within that rubric. But that's all well known in the United States. What isn't well known is that at almost exactly the same time, that, uh, that Secretary Napolitano was, uh, was talking, uh, they were creating a database behind the scenes. The Obama Biden administration was creating a database behind the scenes called the Terrorism and Extremist Violence in the United States. Database. And this database is now publicly available. It is open source information known as OSI. And it is fundamentally biased, I believe deliberately, in order to give the impression that the radical left basically doesn't exist that black nationalism in the country and black radicalism doesn't exist, that Islamic terrorism is less of a threat than it is, and that all of it, all of the violence, all the political violence is really on the right, at least most of it. Now, I could go through chapter and verse, but it would take me hours. I'll give you one example of the way in which this database uh, is, is skewed, and, and just take my word for it or read my study on it, And there's because uh, there's 170 pages worth of this, but one example. The 9-11 hijack, all 19 of them are reflected in the database created by the Obama administration with taxpayer dollars, except that all 19 of them are categorized not as Arab, which is one of the choices in the database. They are all characterized as white, Caucasian, non-Hispanic whites. So what the Obama Biden administration did was take 2,977 deaths and move them from the Arab column to the white column in terms of who perpetrated them. It's the largest terrorist event, of course, in American history. Uh, maybe world history, uh, depending on how you define it. So this is a first example. This was going on behind the scenes in the Obama administration. It was laying the groundwork, in my judgment, for transferring the focus of the security state in the United States away from Islamic terrorism, certainly left-wing uh, groups like Black Lives Matter uh, or Antifa, 
or the Occupy movement, none of which appear in the database at all, as though they didn't exist, as though they had done nothing. Right? They don't exist in the database. And, then tr and change that focus to, uh, to the right. And specifically, you know, racializing it to somebody that is white. That's, so that's number one. Number two is that it is, you know, it's well known that uh, the security state is weaponized against uh, the, the duly elected president of the United States and then presidential candidate Donald Trump. Um, and we could go back and forth on this forever, but, uh, you know, I think it's a matter of public record now that the FBI and this and to some extent, the CIA uh, were in fact used to investigate Donald Trump, and that it has become clear that it was a political dirty trick played by Hillary Clinton's campaign, uh, funded by Hillary Clinton's campaign, and that the FBI knew that and still continued the investigation. So, what I don't think is well known, and what I have an article that is going to be appearing, a 3,000 word article going to be appearing soon. Um, stipulates that there are two individuals inside of the Pentagon who are still there today, uh, who got their positions in very unseemly ways and are not qualified for them. And those individuals appeared to have funded uh, Stephen Halper, who is the Trump spy. Uh, that is, what appears to have happened is that at, the individual did receive about a million dollars in taxpayer money from the United States Pentagon, that is the Department of Defense, and he did spy on the Trump campaign. So, uh, you know, did, what, we, how the resources flowed, I can't tell you. Uh, what exactly was financed by what, I can't tell you. But I can tell you that, according to my research, the uh, Obama-Biden Pentagon was, in fact, funding uh, spying into the, uh, into the campaign of a, of a domestic political opponent. Finally, I would say what is happening after Jan in January 6th riot, um, as, a, as a, a, a opposed to the Black Lives Matter riots, is really indicative. And I've, uh, I've summarized this for you as well. Um, the bottom line is that there was one riot on January 6th associated with the Capitol. There were more than 600 riots the year in the year before uh, that were foisted on us by Black Lives Matter and Antifa. Uh, the Black Lives Matter riots led to 25 deaths. According to the Washington Post, I believe the number is 47, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> but J6, the January 6th riots included only four deaths. Uh, there were 2,000 assaults or injuries of police in the Black Lives Matter riots. There were only, there were 140. Bad, but only 140 on January 6th. Black Lives Matter led to $1 to $2 billion worth of damage. The January 6th riot led to $1.5 million. One one-thousandth of the amount of damage. And finally, the number of murders uh, after the Black Lives Matter Antifa riots rose uh, over that year by 4,091. That's the number I've calculated this week for you. Um, so there are 4,000 additional deaths in the United States uh, that were associated with murders in part because of the pullback of the police in the United States. I'll conclude with this. Um, these three things are three data points. There are three sets of data points which suggest that the culture clash in the United States uh, has been uh, weaponized in the security apparatus of the United States in order to direct it at domestic political opponents. Uh, and my understanding from inside of the security services is that it is also being used to categorize conservative parties in the European Union as far right and therefore potentially linked to domestic extremism or violence. And therefore, the United States security services are watching you, just like they're watching me. So thank you very much for letting me share. I apologize for if I went on too long. I almost certainly did, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Uh, it, was, it was very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, I, 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 I was sure you would... Uh, you would mention as well uh, this uh, this issue associated with uh, uh, educational and 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 the, the p parents in the school these fights yes for against the critical race theory because the, as far as I know they are described as a domestic terrorist as well they are added to the list so it's it's absolutely you, you are right I think it's, yeah it's absolutely another another proof okay le let's go further and uh, now uh, Professor John Radzilowski. Uh, professor of History University, uh, Alaska Southworth. Can we, yeah, Professor? 
please, please. Uh, well, thank you very much. I'm sorry. I will uh, pick up on some of the remarks made by my uh, my colleagues and uh, hopefully to amplify that. But I would like to focus a little bit on the on the intellectual and cultural roots of the cultural clash in the United States. I can't hear. Now, the United States of America, for all of its apparent openness, ubiquity of its popular culture is not an easy country to understand, either for outsiders looking in or for Americans themselves. Its fierce-sized, decentralized political nature and the multiplicity of cultures and beliefs of its people defy easy explanations. America is large, complicated, and messy. What binds Americans to one another is not a culture or a single faith, but a shared set of truths and beliefs that some describe as a civic religion. We hold these truths to be self-evident, reads the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, while the forms and the language of the American founding were the products of the Enlightenment, the ideas they expressed were much older and deeper. The underpinnings of the American identity were based on certain presuppositions, and, and the first of these is that truth exists, it's not the product of human reason. Also, humans are created or created rather than self-made and created to seek virtue. Rights are intrinsic to being human and those rights are definable and fixed. Now, in the past two decades, these basic elements have been under increasingly open attack. And to many observers, the civic religion that bound Americans together has begun to break or fray to the point where pundits now talk about a cold civil war or a cultural revolution. Precisely when this process began is debated. Some conservatives point to the rise of progressivism in the 1890s and 1910s. Others look to the post-World War II period, uh, the advent of postmodernism, uh, particularly in the 1960s. Still others see the problem as latent in the very nature of American politics, uh, present from the time of the founding. Even many thoughtful individuals on the center left have begun to sound the alarm about the rapid, unprecedented radicalization of American society. America's cultural problems are worth understanding in their own right, but are also mirrored by developments in Europe, including in Poland, which appear susceptible to certain tendencies in American politics, particularly those emanating from the American left in universities and the nonprofit NGO sector, including the urge to politicize every aspect of human life, from the most public to the most intimate, resulting in a profound misordering of social norms. Put differently, the disordering of moral, moral, and social, moral and religious values results in a tendency to treat all cultural and moral problems as political ones. The laws, even, even laws when passed in a democratic fashion, prove entirely inadequate to address moral or cultural problems, but invariably result in ever sharper political conflicts in which normal political discourse is replaced with moral language. As one who has taught both U.S. and European history for many years and observed many of these changes firsthand, one of the most difficult problems relates to the loss of the very idea of truth itself. It's increasingly apparent that a large and growing segment of our population not only views truth as relative, but is increasingly unable to recognize that concepts like true and false even exist. While pure relativism is conceptually unsustainable, it's been cynically exploited by radical and totalitarian thinkers throughout the 20th century, and now into the 21st. Naively viewed as a form of personal liberation, relativism gave the party and or the state the power to determine and manipulate what is true and false. In America, too, we see examples of the wealthiest, best credentialed, and most powerful classes of society striving to impose their vision of reality on the rest of the population. And groups like BLM are simply one, one outgrowth of that. However, given America's strong sense of individualism, uh, the many centrifugal elements present in the American experiment, this is just as likely to lead to social and cultural chaos as to some forms of totalitarianism. Either way, it signals a potentially complete collapse of American civic religion with potentially catastrophic consequences. The decline of this so-called civic religion, however, cannot be separated from the decline of actual religion, which is another serious factor and directly related to the rise of relativism. America was founded on a broadly understood framework of Judeo-Christian morals, and, those, and its, concepts of virtue was, its concept of virtue was central to the country's founders. 
This framework was separate from any denomination, but relied on a robust religious landscape, which inculcated generations of Americans in basic truths necessary to the proper functioning of the public, which served as the source of the country's social cohesion in place of a unitary national culture. Steadily declining church attendance, along with poor or non-existent catechesis in most churches and synagogues, has resulted in a population ill-suited to moral, social, or cultural engagement or to serious politics and more and more prone to radicalism. As G.K. Chesterton wrote, when we cease to worship God, we do not worship nothing, we worship anything. The impulse to worship and to conceive of the world in moral terms is as strong as ever in America. Only the objects of worship have changed. The, the, the many colleges in America that were once dedicated to training Protestant ministers still turn out preachers aplenty. Only now they enter fields such as public education, social work, or the growing bureaucracy dedicated to diversity. Alas, the same is true of many supposedly Catholic colleges as well. Chesterton's quip is now on display in the USA, where numerous novel cults compete for attention and adoration of the public. Several are particularly pervasive, such as scientism, or the belief that science provides coherent and final answers to all human problems, material or spiritual. Another equally common cult is that of the victim. Like scientism, the victim cult has deep roots in Western civilization, albeit as a kind of perversion of this one of the central beliefs of Christianity. The modern cult of the victim does away with the spiritual dimensions and suffer, of suffering, particularly the redemptive power of Christ's passion and death, and replaces it with materialist and political meaning. Past suffering, particularly racial and social discrimination, gives those claiming the mantle of victimhood moral and political authority with racism, sexism, or homophobia serving as the original sins. In a society where traditional sources of authority have withered, or are viewed as compromised, victimhood fills the vacuum that is left behind. Authors such as John McWhorter and Joseph Bottom have called attention to how closely American progressivism resembles a kind of secular Puritanism, whose followers they refer to as the elect. Recalling John Calvin's belief in the visible elect, who he saw as special recipients of God's grace and thus predestined for heaven. The cult of victimhood thus acts as a, as a way for secular elites to determine who qualifies as righteous and who is damned. The righteous are those who are collectively said to have suffered some past wrongs or injustice at the hands of the damned, but a more careful examination of this concept reveals that the righteous victims in this case may have only a very loose connection to the past harms that confer the status of being a victim. Not all victims of past injustice, however, are created equal, and the cult itself is continually roiled by competing claims of victimization, even among official victim groups. The cult of victimhood, of, of course, is not a true faith, but is a kind of zombie religion. It mimics certain aspects of religion, particularly forms of American Protestantism. It allows for broad and far-reaching condemnations of wide segments of American society, while immunizing those hurling the condemnations from scrutiny prove especially effective in silencing traditional forms of religious expression and anathematizing patriotism. Its power derives from the fact that racism and, and slavery were true evils in American history, whose effects were serious and far-reaching. Its adherents, the elect, gained, gained power by purporting to speak on behalf of the victims of, of those past injustices, most of which are conveniently dead. Yet the cult is not overly concerned with the complex history of race and discrimination in America but rather in using the past in powerful and emotive ways to shock and disarm its targets. Here we should note that the main beneficiaries of this cult are primarily wealthy, upper middle class whites, and the cult appears to have a malignant interest in perpetuating social problems and deprivation among African Americans and other minorities whose deprivation, whether real or theoretical, lends the cult its power. Indeed, the cult's ideal victims are viewed as utterly helpless in the face of the supposedly overwhelming forces of institutionalized discrimination against which the elect mobilized their forces. In turn, the elect demand an ever-expanding menu of rights, which they administer on behalf of the victim. In America, the cult of victims has a, has a hold on a wide swath of the country's elite, particularly in academia and education, media and culture, corporations, government, and public service. The elect firmly hold to a kind of reverse exceptionalism in which America is not, in Lincoln's words, the last best hope of mankind, 
but rather the source of all the world's evil and the cause of all the unrealized good. This self-hatred is only apparent. Since the elect displace their country's evil, supposedly, onto their political adversaries, who are generally less wealthy, less powerful, and much less well-credentialed. More important, the elect seek, in the words of former President Obama, to fundamentally transform the country into a utopia matching their vision. That transformation demands a nihilistic destruction of the country that is, and the absolute and undemocratic power to remake things according to their will. While the cult of the victim may be relatively recent, the old serpent of totalitarian utopia that lurks within it is not. Although the situation in the USA is disturbing to say the least, as with most things, it is only part of the story. The complexity and size of America make it hard to impose absolute programs of power on the country effectively. America remains far more religious in the true sense than most other industrialized countries. And while secularism has caused great damage to American society and to politics, there are many countervailing elements as well. The pertinent question in the American case is how a country so divided in its moral and social orientation can find a way to exist as a coherent political entity in the future. So to sum up, secularism acts as a kind of acid eating away at the moral and spiritual roots of society. And its effects are visible in the USA, but also in countries such as Ireland or Spain, as well as even in Poland. Secularization replaces real faith with zombie religions, such as the cult of victims, and it politicizes and disorders all elements of society, from individual consciences and families to schools and universities, to the very functioning of democracy itself. Emotive and powerful appeals to victimhood undermine civic and personal, personal virtues, emphasizing helplessness and demanding ever greater power and control from the self-appointed elect in order to remedy the problem. Only by countering the acid of secularism can this process be arrested. This should be taken as task and mission for all those concerned about a free, free peoples, uh, men and women, now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, now it's time for the French perspective. Uh, Professor Thomas Flichy de la Uville, uh, France. Professor, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your invitation. I'm very happy to be with you. It's our pleasure, of course. Um, how could we summarize the clash of cultures in the US? What we see currently is a technocracy currently destroying a living, a living civilization. But how technocracy operate? Well, sometimes with pretty traditional means. In effect, the cultural transformations which are ongoing owe their power to the rational, systematic use of discoveries uh, made uh, by behavioral conditioning since the mid 19th century. And this intelligence use of the classics has enabled social engineering to divert our attention quite radically away from the functions it was initially programmed for, namely spotting dangers or concentrating on the mysteries of the great behold that lies outside earthly's briefs light candle. And within two decades, information technology has formed a screen between humankind and eternity. So whether we like it or not, the, the global internet prospers from the reductio ad bestiam of the human sphere. So the risk is that we will be treated like Pavlov's dog or John Watson's rats or Skinner's. And huge improvements have been made since the interwar period. So we are 
um, in, in the United States, um, one part of the population is caged by its basest instincts and becomes prisoners of its own ignorance. And this enslavement has been carefully orchestrated by academic engineering that robs students of the only intellectual resources that enable them to grow, specifically silent reading and disputatio. And, disputatio. and silent reading and debate have been replaced by ideological conditioning and technical hyperspatial. Empty boxes have thus been created and um, find themselves in harmony with digital teaching, which is in fact teaching in name only. So those who operate, those who destroy cultures, use a captology as a way to change attitudes, to change behaviors. And we know that one of the designers of Captology was Brian Jeffrey Fogg, a student of the Sicilian American psychologist Zimbardo. In 2003, Fogg published a book entitled Persuasive Technology, using computers to change what we think and what we do. And it is clear that Fogg's model blends behaviorism with the new lessons of neurosciences. Now, who are these people who preside over persuasive technologies? All that can be said of them is that these lucid operators are very few in number. They are a minority, and their ultimate end is to create all new maniacs. Um, this disease is suffered by those who suffer compulsive buying disorder. So the lucid operators of captology are a minority, and it's within their interest to confine IT specialists a purely technical role so that they get only the most diffuse and indistinct glimpse of the aims behind remotely programmed imperceptible movements. These techniques of mental manipulation have been used in the 19th century. They've been used also during the French Revolution so as to enable, enable a minority to exert power over a majority. And contrary to popular opinion, the masters of captology do not necessarily operate from the top down. They operate from the space beyond, from the circles just below power. And, and thus emerge, emerges a world in which uh, the cultural subject is going to be operated, hypnotized, manipulated, and in the end transformed into a mental slave. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you very much. So, uh, so very interesting. Uh, perspective and and the answer uh, made by the professor is is that the technology is is the main issue. Uh, yeah, I, I was taking part uh, and I'm constantly being asked, like I think like everybody here to to discuss these issues. And sometimes I, I hear that sometimes people say that uh, they are very tired of just uh, describing the situation. I know this is the professor's role, and I know this is the the science uh, attitude, but uh, uh, w what, what our guests, what do you guests, what do you think uh, 
we can do we should do something we can react or just uh, this is the fate inevitable we can't do nothing uh, we, we can change we can fight or we have to adopt this is the the one of the of the question given by this conference so I'm, I'm very curious uh, how do you see these issues professor yeah okay the Washington please <laughs> the voice from Washington uh, so uh, my own view is that there that uh, you know we should fight three words right we should fight uh, how it is done is an interesting question so let me uh, talk uh, let me say uh, two things first of all at the individual level I think that there are three basic mechanisms that we should consider as citizens, as patriots. Uh, and those are, um, first of all, money. Uh, and by money, I mean where our money goes. We should be very careful about uh, what companies we're supporting and what taxes we're paying. So, <clears throat> um, so my recommendation is to evaluate the, uh, the spending that we do to make certain that as little as possible of it is going to the uh, those who are, I think, regime supplicants. Um, and uh, Professor Fischi, I think, uh, is is exactly right uh, in my judgment and. The individuals who are actually orchestrating um, these technically market-based uh, manipulations of the mind are capturing very large amounts of money, and I would suggest, you know, that we try to stop that. Right. So um, we be very careful about the degree to which we're using Facebook or anything other Facebook or Twitter or other social media platforms for anything other than extracting resources from them and spreading messages. The truth is, of course, they'll shut down a lot of what it is that uh, traditionalists would want to say. Uh, the, the second thing that I would suggest uh, <clears throat> would be to think about mind share. And that is uh, control of what media we consume and the education space uh, around us. So uh, doing things like taking over school boards, which uh, is a major issue in the elections which just took place in the United in, States. In Virginia, yes. Yeah, so. uh, uh, getting teachers fired. Uh, which has been done, you know, is, is been, they've been pushed out routinely at least in the United States, professors have been systematically uh, <clears throat> systematically purged from universities over the course of long periods of time. And certainly uh, the hiring process is more and more about keeping these individuals out. I think it's very important that we redirect our own children and uh, others to educational facilities which share our values and that we do everything that we can to purge the, uh, the educational facilities which we, over which we have any control. And so um, we should be organizing um, very aggressively uh, at, our, at the local level uh, to, and monitoring extremely closely what it is that the educators and the administrators are doing um, in capturing mind, mind share. So, you know, don't subscribe, right, and, and encourage others not to subscribe to the major outlets which are not, which are, which are trying to capture more mind share and turn it to nefarious purposes and do the same with education. And by the way, the same with any other organization of which we are a part and in which we have any power. Um, the third thing is, and that brings me to membership, third M is membership. Uh, and I would suggest that in any organization uh, where we have any degree of power, we should be very focused on who is a member and who is not a member and seek to 
imposed costs as high as possible within the law on those uh, who are attempting to manipulate uh, those groups. And uh, uh, this is something that the, I think that the right, generally speaking, has been very poor at and has, uh, you know, there's been unilateral surrender for decades where the idea is, oh, well, we, if we engage in that, then we are morally at the same level as our adversaries. Well, you know, Christian doctrine is very clear about what happens when someone strays. Uh, Christians are called to do three things. First, you uh, individually approach the individual and call him to uh, reform. Second, you as a group, again, membership, right? You call on the individual to reform. And third, if this individual does not reform or repent, you expel the individual from the group, from the Christian group. That's what we are called to do. That's the, that's the explicit instruction in scripture. We need to be doing that. And we have not been doing it. That's what I, I would recommend. Yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. Go to the brother and say you are doing wrong. But my question to the professor uh, Thomas uh, uh, Frischi, uh, uh, professor, once, uh, as if, because I was really impressed by, by your lecture, thank you very much, like, of course, of, by, by the all of our lectures, but once, as a father, I was given an advice, you should treat all mobile devices, all, all these computers, which are, of course, needed, and your 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 children should be taught how to use it, but you should treat them as, as your enemies. This is the, the, the key issue to uh, keep the children uh, in, in the circle of your values. Do you agree or uh, you, you don't? I, I, must, I may say that it works, yeah, but it works. But uh, uh, whenever I allow uh, this, this computer uh, devices, mobiles, the wizards, smartphone, yeah, to, to dominate my, my children's life, even for one hour, even for one day, then I immediately lose. They are not mine anymore. Uh, um, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in your point of view to this. <coughs> first, I would like to, to give an answer to, the, to your first question. Of course, of course, I'm sorry. Um, I think that those who want to destroy cultures have already lost because they are struggling against realities. They are struggling against the truth. So their fight is already lost. They might have the money, but we have something much more powerful. <clears throat> we have the courage to say the truth. And the energy of the truth is incredible. And I am sure our, our, our colleagues on this panel make, like myself, the daily experience of the effect of saying the truth to uh, our audience, to a group of students. They feel very well when you lie. The second remark I would like to, to, to make is that the global connection of the world, the digitalization of the world, is bringing about the formation of little cultural bubbles and the radicalization of all cultures. The new fuel, the new fuel of capitalism, is our taste. So people might want to destroy cultures, but the whole system at the present time is bringing about a radicalization of every single culture. As for your last and very interesting question about what use should we make uh, of, of digital tools? That's, of course, uh, a daily question for, for us fathers and with our, with our children. I think one of the best ways to fight against um, 
the influence of digital tools is to develop the artistic sense of our children. If we are able to develop uh, musical training, theater, painting, drawing, these arts will be the best counter poisons to um, the impact of digital tools. So, the encouragement of the arts seems to be very important in education. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, I do agree. Uh, the, the, yeah, yeah, the, and the last, last, the last sentence, last word from Professor Rajikovsky. Uh, maybe, maybe this is the, the way we we, are, we will be able to, to sum up something. Thank you. Um, and to, to address your original question, uh, I believe there is no choice. We have we we have no choice. It's not a question of to fight or not fight. The fight is here. The war, the war has come, yeah, it's uh, true. and we have we, we have no there, there's no alternative at this point. Uh, so the question is how we fight, uh, rather than whether we fight. Uh, and, and I think uh, as uh, and I would I, I would echo uh, what the professor just said about the importance of art and culture. Uh, these are these are absolutely critical. Additionally, I would say the spiritual dimension uh, and the uh, Every, every percentage, and we see this in certainly the United States, but also in Poland, um, every, every percentage of uh, the population that is not actively practicing their faith um, is, is a loss to us. So this is one of the, one of the important bulwarks of society uh, that is outside of the control of, of the elites, uh, that is accessible to, uh, to uh, all men and women, uh, and and so th this is something that these is we, we see we see this secularization preceding many of these trends um, and in the United States this has gone back many decades uh, so this is this is not a new this is not a new problem in the United States we now see the impacts of this further down the stream so countering countering some of those tendencies is very important um, and and to to pick up on your previous question about the role of parents, um, you know, it's not simply catechizing your your own children, but also um, the witness of you of, of your faith, uh, of, you, of your of, of your commitment to something higher than yourself. Uh, uh, as I think the professor pointed out, this, this, this the, the world that we live in, the digital world. Um, it is very, it's very narcissistic and very self-focused. Um, and uh, every every opportunity we have to step away from that, on a personal level uh, or in organizations, uh, as, as Professor Hull pointed out, um, is needs to be taken. Uh, but but we need it's uh, the, the the left had the long march through the institutions. Um, there needs to be now a counter revolution. A, 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 another long march uh, through the institutions, uh, and uh, because and, and or or to create alternative methods of education, um, we we remember from Polish history 123 years of partition uh, when you know the, the, the Polish history or culture was was discouraged or could not be taught. Um, it was taught in the homes. It was it was taught uh, uh, in, in private. Uh, and again, during the period of communism. Um, and so while these is not, we're, we're in a very different situation perhaps in some ways today, uh, uh, it, the, these are things that we can reflect upon and, and perhaps draw strength from. Yeah. Okay, F thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. You are absolutely right looking back uh, into the Polish history. Uh, we see that everything is possible and uh, uh, yeah, there is no, no limits uh, of our dreams. Uh, this is uh, the bad luck and, uh, and I think very sad fate of, of being the last panel in, uh, during the day, during the conference. But uh, yes, our time is, is coming to end. So uh, 
thank you very much. This conference is, is uh, scheduled for three days, so uh, we, we will be happy if you, if you will uh, observe, we will we'll take part in some way, in, and maybe we meet, uh, we'll meet in, um, uh, in some of the panels of, of uh, next year's conference. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we are we are very s s happy that that it was possible to to hold uh, the discussion and and this is I think uh, one of the advantages of the of the <laughs> of the technology. Yeah? We are able to discuss through continents, through uh, countries, uh, through languages. Even uh, have a good night from the Polish perspective <laughs> and and thank you thank very you. much. Dziękuję. Dziękuję.